Uh, briefly, I would very much like to thank uh, Basit for hosting us in Yaliz in November for being you know, so organizational. Equally thank Bashak and Jack. Um, just to give you some sense of the role that Ibraz played in the Jerusalem show, which for us was a tremendous pleasure and quite a challenge. Um, Bashak approached us four months before the Jerusalem show with an idea to have an online catalog that would include four essays, all the bios of all the artists, all the statements of all the artists, all the images of all the artists, all the maps where the work was going to be, and uh, a guide, an online guide. Now, I've worked 20 years in publishing, and in the back of my head, I was thinking, that is impossible, period. What I was saying, of course, given Bashak's boundless enthusiasm was, yeah, we can do this. <laughs> um, and in retrospect, she did do it, and she did it with the help of a lot of people that are in this room presently who really pulled out the stops. Mm -hmm. A lot of help from Ibraz, Stephanie Bailey yes. should be mentioned, yes. Nursa Krani. And I recall towards the end, um, quite literally, everything coming together, and I had a dream one night that I was editing the catalog. But it wasn't like a quick two-minute dream. It was like a four-hour dream. I was like <laughs> page, 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 <laughs> pencil mark. I, pen I can remember it all. I woke up feeling like I'd done a day's work. And um, it was extraordinary, though. It went online. We were very pleased because it then... And we were talking earlier, Basif was talking about access. Uh, we get figures from the almighty Google. And I think we had, over a period of four weeks, 21,000 wow. downloads specific to the Jerusalem show. Oh my God. And the guide, uh, you can get the PDF, Google, it's amazing. I don't, know, I don't know what we did before Google, probably nothing. But um, <laughs> you can actually get the PDF count. And I think it was 11,500 at one point, um, which was very impressive, uh, I think, again. It helped us to extenuate the footprint, which again, given issues around access, given issues around the historical specificity of that space, expanding that into a virtual dimension, I think had an impact above and beyond what was happening on the ground, so to speak. So for us personally, coming to this was an important step for us too, because one of the projects that we were undergoing with Ibraz at that moment was mapping cartographies, looking at south-south and global-south relations. And one of my preoccupations is around the issue of epistemology. Uh, what knowledge is produced? What are the limits of knowledge? What are the limits of understanding? What are the origins of knowledge itself? And the key question there is, what knowledge does art produce? And that's a very loaded question in as much as, <coughs> increasingly, with the commodification of knowledge itself, all knowledge is reducible to a financial value. And I think what we were trying to do was look at different ways of examining precisely what knowledge art was producing. And it occurred to me over a period of time that the knowledge that art produces is not reducible to a scientific or even a cultural basis. And I think that knowledge and what artists do specifically, they produce speculative forms of knowledge. Knowledge that progress into a future time look towards a horizon of potentiality broader than the present or indeed the past. And this began to interest me in the context of what the Jerusalem show was doing, and specifically the three artists that we have here today. This notion of speculative knowledge, this notion of speculative narrative opening up. And the other thing that interested me, and the thing that this fed into mostly, was the notion of fractures. Uh, this sense of a fracture uh, in a negative and a positive sense. A fracture can be something that is it rents asunder space, time, people. But equally, a fracture can be a small caesura or a schism into which we can look. It can be productive. It can produce a different aperture space within which we can produce our own knowledge systems. So bearing all that in mind, we brought together these three artists under the rubric of mapping, but also under the rubric of knowledge production. What types of knowledge are being produced. And again, I don't want to be reductive about this, because I think this should be about the potentiality, the speculative potentiality of what each of these artists has done on the ground. So, bearing all that in mind, a number of things emerged from that, our archiving being, I think, very, very uh, particular to each of the artists' works here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to briefly introduce each of the artists, and I'm going to read a little bit of their bio, but only as far as it pertains to the work we're going to talk about today. Uh, firstly, to my right is Connor uh, McGrady. It's Grady, yes, not Grady. 
Yeah, Grady in the north, uh, Grady everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> the north of Northern Ireland. As a fellow Irishman, these things are tricky, seriously. Yeah. Nomenclature is everything. Um, but Conor Grady, uh, we see the BA honours from the University of Northumbria, UK, and an MFA from the uh, University of Chicago. Um, Conor's work specifically, and he's going to talk about the broad context, and again, I find this of interest, is that it looks at the politics of spatial control. Uh, the broader context of the practice is also looking at modernist divisions of space itself, and equally what happened after the utopian, hubristic ideal of modernism. To my left, and you've already heard from uh, Benji, is Benji, <coughs> my left view. And very briefly, because Benji's uh, CV is quite lengthy here, uh, the specific thing that I want to look at in relation to Benji's work, and he has a Master's of Architecture with Research Distinction from Paris La Vallette in Urban Sociology, is the notion of preemptive archaeologization or preemptive archivation, something that he's already spoken about. He's going to talk about that in the broader context of his practice, and perhaps we can come back to some of the specifics. To my far right is uh, Goldson. Uh, kind of Mustafa. Let me read very briefly here, folks. I'm just going to give you a list of the point in me giving you this list. Uh, graduated from the Istanbul State of Fine Arts Academy. She's participated in the second, third, and fourth international Istanbul biennials, the third Wangju biennial, the eighth Havana biennial, the third Sentinja uh, biennial, the first international biennial of contemporary art Seville, the eleventh international Cairo biennial, the third Singapore biennial, the first mm -hmm. Kiev biennial, the fourth Thessaloniki <laughs> biennial, and the tenth Wangju, and the third and first Sao Paulo. <laughs> Biennial. Now, <coughs> obviously she's biennial out, but you <laughs> 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 should just say we're biennial in your honor, actually. <laughs> Goldson's going to talk specifically about cognitive mapping as an artist engaging in an itinerant practice. And again, I think this is part of the broader context, perhaps, which we'll come back to when we start looking specifically at these artist practices, and when we look more specifically at how they map alternative cartographies, or indeed transnational cartographies that open up perhaps other spaces for knowledge to emerge. So, without further ado, I've asked each of the artists to prepare a five to six minute presentation on their work, which they will now do. Um, I think we may take it in the following order. If we go, Wilson, yeah. Connor, yeah. Yeah. then ideally, uh, I would ask one or two questions. But I don't think the focus here is me necessarily asking questions. It'd be great to get the audience engaged. Um, and again, perhaps the audience is talking amongst themselves. So, uh, so go sir. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, you made a, quite a good introduction <laughs> for me with the biennials. Well, uh, I would like to turn back to year 1997, when I was invited to a show in Sweden, north of Sweden, uh, to a city called Boras and to the Boras Kunstmuseum. Actually, when we uh, were, were asked to, to talk about the alternative cartographies, I wished to start with this uh, story because, you know, uh, that was a time that we uh, started to weave these maps. You know, uh, it started with the beginning of 1990s and now this uh, system has grown into something that very, very strong, actually. Uh, in the list of this exhibition, there was Netko Solakov, Jimmy Durham, Carlos Capellan, Fernanda Gomez, Zubin, and Sophie Sidon, and other artists, like I can't remember much. Boros was a very small city, uh, and uh, a center for textiles, where uh, you know, only the clothing industry was taking place. There was one museum which was not, you know, very exciting. But for us at that time, it was a very exciting offer because it was a museum and it was uh, an exhibition which brought together all those uh, important names I could remember. And uh, for that exhibition, I uh, as an artist who is based in Istanbul, uh, the name of the exhibition I should mention, it was Around Us, Inside Us. And for that, while I was going around and trying to find uh, a, 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 a creative uh, moment for myself, I came across these very small uh, jackets 
uh, the uniforms for the kids in one part of Istanbul. And then I thought, if these uniforms, these uniforms were created for, uh, for those children, for schools and everything, to wear uh, in the uh, celebrations of these national uh, gatherings, actually. And uh, through this, I found another photograph, which I integrated into this work. And I called it, uh, the name was, Where the Continents Meet. Uh, actually, Istanbul is a point where the continents meet. And I found those objects, one in the Asian side and the other in the, uh, in the European side. So bringing together, uh, I was really trying to make something which was totally from my geography. But the reference was uh, that in 1996, uh, the Balkan War had just came to an end. And at the same time, Iraq War had begun. So with this work, I went to Boroas, Boroas at the north of, a, or north of Sweden, a cold city. It was cold winter. And there I found my friends who were, all of us were interested in these small uh, exhibitions because, you know, uh, it was just the beginning of everything. Uh, we had, you know, an opening which was not very interesting. But we were there, and I remember one evening uh, after the opening, we sat there and uh, in, within our works, and uh, uh, Jimmy Durham uh, sang for us his uh, native songs from from the, uh, the from what we know, just to cheer us up in this uh, northern city of Sweden. Uh, actually, what was our expectations from this very lonely and cold city of the north? Was it the power relations that we were asking for? Which kind of uh, power this was bringing us to us? Or what was our urge to push forward to those points in the world to, to show our work and to communicate ourselves? Uh, actually, we uh, did create uh, a very important cartography, an alternative cartography, with all these artists' work moving from one place to the other and creating these relationships, give and take, and so on, with all these <coughs> movements that we made. And at this point, I would like to talk about my map <coughs> of travels. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was amazing that I sat down and for this talk I tried to find out to how many exhibitions that I have participated since the beginning of 1990s and how many of them were in which part of uh, the world. I found out an amazing list uh, because I have showed in Germany 42 times in Germany, 32 times in Austria, 15 times in Italy, 12 times in Switzerland, 11 times in USA, 10 times in France, 7 times in Holland, 6 times in Sweden, 6 times in Korea, five in Greece, four in Spain, three in Romania, three in Denmark, Canada, China, Kosovo, Serbia, Cyprus, England, Slovenia, India, Bulgaria, Israel, twice, Albania, Japan, Algeria, Cuba, Montenegro, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Belgium, Macedonia, Taiwan, Slovakia, Czechia, Armenia, Georgia, Egypt, Australia, Portugal, Singapore, Mexico, Ukraine, and Brazil once. So it makes up to uh, 196 <laughs> exhibitions altogether. But I'm not boasting about, about this. I'm not uh, making a scene with uh, saying what I have done until now. No. 
This is a list uh, which any of our artists' friends, if they look at their CVs, can find out according to their ages, because I'm coming from an older generation, uh, according to their age uh, positions, they can find this kind of a map and they can find that they have invested so much into this map making of contemporary art. So when we come to, uh, to, to the point where when we are asked about alternative cartographies or what art is doing while, uh, you know, while artists are going rushing from one place to the other, Bashak rushing to Macedonia uh, and then to, to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem and then immediately to Canada or something like that. You know, uh, this is the thing what we have done uh, within this 25 years, uh, the last decade of the 20th century and the first 15 years of the, this, uh, this century. And um, actually, uh, the, 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 our works really create links between uh, the cultures. Our works, I think, do whatever they, ha they are up to. You know, mm -hmm. this is what I can say now. I can, you Thank know. you very much, yeah. And perhaps this is something to come back to, because obviously, as much as contemporary art has been a critique, apparently a critique of globalization, it's been a key agent in globalization, if not on the vanguard of a neoliberal ideal of culture somehow opening up borders. Um, and in many ways, it has been reactionary. And what you've mapped there is almost the flip side of what we consider contemporary art to be. Um, perhaps we can come back and talk to Jack and uh, Bashak about that shortly. Okay. Yeah, so some recent uh, thematic concerns that I think uh, should hopefully expand some of this uh, discussion a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth, and I'm also going to be presenting on some of the, the work from the Jerusalem show later on uh, today as well. But very briefly, you know, um, the, the basis of my work, or a big uh, thematic uh, strand in my work, is the, the notion of architecture as a signifier of sociological and geopolitical control. Um, the roots of, of these concerns uh, really lie in my own background growing up in, uh, uh, in a divided uh, territory, in a territory in, in, in a, in with uh, similar to a certain extent that there are many dissimilarities to the Palestinian situation being the, the Northern Irish conflict. So the idea of division, partition, separation uh, has been sort of uh, integral to my own development as a, not just as an artist but as a human being. So, so the work has its roots in this sort of idea of architecture as, as, a, f as a form of mapping and controlling uh, movement and terrain within the broader framework of an ocular centric society. The, the idea of the, uh, the nation state or the, the state entity as a, as a, as a panopticon, as a, as a form, as a means of ocular centric uh, control. So just to give you some of the, uh, again, just some earlier work from a, a few years ago. Um, so in some of these works, the built environment uh, is really consi uh, considered a framework for surveillance, extraction, removal, uh, the containment and the, uh, the, you know, the disappearance of unwanted populations, in a sense. So some of these works, you know, again, the deploying idea of the cul-de-sac as a, as a means of uh, entrapment, in a sense. So the modes of representation I'm working on rely pre predominantly on the process of drawing as a means of investigation. And, uh, and the, the approaches to drawing include uh, the utilization of the fragment, the system, the sequence, the idea of the insertion, the idea of the intrusion, and the idea of the epic or the bombastic uh, in terms of how we look at visual representation of uh, the domination of space. So there's a cinematic uh, quality to some of these earlier works that also references history painting and colonial, you know, again, the sort of romantic uh, colonial narratives of how space is perceived and, and, and enclosed and, and encapsulated in a sense. Um, so the drawings, uh, and then some of the more recent drawings that feed into the work in the Jerusalem show rely heavily on the visual language of modernism uh, with an emphasis on hybrid structures that merge uh, the bunker uh, with high modernism. Um, I think modernism is always contained within it an element of control, 
uh, despite its vision for social progress, its, uh, its, its utopian vision, there was always an element of control. I think with the failure of the modernist project, as Anthony has pointed out uh, in his introduction, we are, uh, not to be too pessimistic, but I think we're left primarily with uh, the absence of the visionary and the, the predominance of, of the, this, this core element of control, in a sense. Uh, these are some of the, uh, the, the those previous images are from uh, another uh, project uh, created by Barshak, uh, the Biennial in uh, Konich uh, Bunker uh, near Sarajevo in Bosnia, just to give you an idea of the space. Uh, these are just uh, some of these uh, small uh, gicle uh, prints that were inserted into the uh, into the sort of labyrinthine structure of this uh, of this uh, bunker. And again, some of the you know this use of sort of figurative representational imagery that has gradually been reduced uh, in the practice overall. So uh, so coming to the uh, the Jerusalem show, in particular what I'm really interested in, uh, I was looking at three, you know, I didn't get a chance to, to, I'm going to talk in more detail later, but I didn't get a chance to do a preliminary research trip. So I was sort of uh, thinking, uh, you know, again, some of the thematic concerns that had been very prominent, prominent in my own practice, such as ideas of uh, geopolitical control and sociological control. So I think that, you know, that was really the start and off point for the basis of the work in Jerusalem. And, and just being in the city for a few days, these three themes really emerged. Uh, ideas of enclosure, intrusion, and erasure. So I'm just going to read you. Uh, I mean, I could ad lib, but I think I just, it's easier to put notes down on paper. So enclosure references not just the idea of uh, geopolitical enclosure or ghettoization, but the idea of the state as a form of ideological enclosure. Ideological mapping of, uh, of place in Jerusalem is an attempt to recreate the idea of the city as a fortress, uh, with the Zionist project being analogous to, uh, to that of a wall, a garden, uh, a keep, a bulwark. Uh, again, that's sort of defensive, uh, uh, constantly, perpetually under siege. Uh, that's, again, defined on a meta level by uh, ideas of protection and nurture. So enclosure also connotes uh, ideas of entrapment, uh, ideas of, of cellular structures. Um, so, uh, and again, uh, the second sort of thematic concern was the idea of intrusion, which relates directly to the control of space and the insertion of military structures, bunkers, barricades, walls, watchtowers, checkpoints, settlements into real space as an act of, uh, as an aggressive act of seizure on one level. It also relates again to ideological intrusion, uh, to ideological absolutism, to a, a totalistic form of thinking that is predicated on the removal of the other. Uh, the architecture of intrusion, like that of enclosure, deploys geometry as a weapon in the control of space. Um, so the architecture of the hammam is defined very much by the circle and by the labyrinth, uh, but, but also uh, by ideas of space and, and of light. So in a way, for this project, I'm inserting these, these hard-edged, brutal, brutalist, uh, bunker-like forms uh, into this space to really engage in a dialogue between the... Uh, with the spatial dynamics, in a sense. Uh, and again, erasure um, is very much about the act of removal. The utopian, the utopian narrative of a tabula rasa, of white, uh, purified space, of empty landscapes and urban palm cests. Uh, the use of trees has been well documented in, in terms of the, uh, the colonization, uh, the design of this colonial project to cover over ruins, uh, you know, even Benji's project probably taps into this a little bit as well. Um, but it's ultimately defined by uh, the, the creation of the void, the blind spot, uh, not just geopolitically in real terrain, but also, again, in terms of uh, this inability to, to see the other. So these are just a few slides. I'm going to, later on, I'm going to go into more detail um, when I give an overview. But just to give you a sense of some of the broader thematic concerns and how, again, how, how cartography and how map making is, is both a contested uh, a discipline, if you like, uh, particularly when we look at ideas of colonization and conflict, uh, but also how maybe again how artists can, can create counter hegemonic uh, narratives or counter hegemonic maps to, to contest and open up and uh, this, uh, you know, this, the dominant framework for control to, to make it a more, uh, a space of possibilities in a sense. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you, Connor. Uh, Benji's just going to put a slide in. Just an image. I'll let you. Do you want to switch over? Or? Yeah. 
give a little bit of a hint of what is going on, helping easing people to see the problems related to the way this country is perceived from abroad, because of course um, it is totally controlled, the perception of what is going on there. And yeah, then I always, and coming back to my practice, I was saying, I, after architecture, I switched to, to painting. I consider myself more, more a painter, but I do think uh, it's not a question of, for me, painting has essentially become a tool in order to convey conceptual ideas. For example, the question of heritage and preventive archeology span in the Jerusalem pro show project, in this project, uh, <coughs> recreating a map totally out of like scratch with hardly any tools, just by drawing, just by using the tools that I enjoy the most using. And then the third project that was exhibited also, the first exhibition at El Manor that was dealing with the notion of uh, heritage, but in a very different way, the heritage of ornaments, basically. So I don't know, maybe more questions will come forward because I already presented my work before. We'll take a moment. Yeah. It will be easier. Thank you, But I got a question for Bashak and for Jack. And I was hoping just to sort of engage a certain tension here, which is perhaps already being raised to a certain extent by Basi. What we have heard thus far is a form of cognitive mapping, which Goldson has amply outlined as a kind of almost a sketch of globalization and contemporary art and the biannualization of contemporary art being a map that perfectly maps <coughs> globalization, that neoliberal will towards the politicization of culture itself. And then we drill down to a more granular detail in that form of cognitive mapping, which is much more specific to the city. What I wanted to ask you, Bashak, and Jack as well, was there is a danger, of course, that the Jerusalem show just becomes another stop-off point, or it becomes contextualized within this contemporary art forward slash globalization uh, process. But the specificity of the city itself seems to actually ward against that, because there's so much serendipity involved, there is so much that you cannot control. And it seems to me that that serendipity opens up potential and new possibilities. And it seems to a certain extent that you guys are right in the middle of that tension between a globalized art world wanting more spectacle, the specificities of Jerusalem, which is historically, geopolitically exact, but also contained, and how do you use that productively? Uh, we created the Jerusalem show. Uh, knowing that plugging into the uh, art circuit and the biennial circuit and, and <coughs> to, uh, this uh, international exposure <coughs> uh, is a way to uh, bring attention to what's happening over there. Mm. Is a way to break that state of isolation. Is a way to go against uh, the policies that the government is enacting on a daily basis and uh, in a way to maintain uh, a certain kind of um, multiplicity of voices and uh, uh, where otherwise what's, uh, uh, what's kept disseminated uh, particularly through the official uh, channels, uh, is a is a very uh, uh, it's a very controlled uh, uh, story mm. that uh, basically um, that basically uh, pushes uh, that geopolitical uh, uh, context within well within the the heart of the Israeli Zionist. Uh, project and uh, uh, for example to me I was uh, a bit uh, how should I say uh, and maybe sorry Gulsun I was a bit taken back by Gulsun saying that I was twice in Israel to me well it's not Israel to me it's Palestine or occupied Palestine <laughs> the way <laughs> you know which way uh, you want to uh, call it uh, means a lot in, the t in, in, in terms of uh, how we, the people who are from there, who have lived there, who ancestors are from there, and who are 
you know, claiming self-determination, claiming our identity in a place that is gradually being uh, stolen from us. Uh, so, yes, it is uh, all-knowingly plugging into this system, into this mm -hmm. uh, network, and uh, uh, maybe, and even, uh, actually, I want to mention something about the Colombia International context. We've created the Colombia International context in order to raise that visibility to, to even a higher level, because mm -hmm. we thought that whatever we do at the Jerusalem show, and the walk, and Sahikini, and all the few institutions that who work, can actually reach up to a certain level. Uh, there's a certain ceiling that we've, that we've hit, and our resources cannot allow us to kind of break through that uh, um, ceiling. And we don't have any kind of governmental or uh, large institutional support that will allow us to to uh, transcend that uh, level or to kind of step into uh, the, this higher threshold of exposure. So the concept of Planja International was to pull all these institutions together, create one event uh, that speaks on behalf of all of this, so you have a, a program that is rich and diverse and, uh, and, and, and uh, engages so many different players at the same time, and has the resources because uh, you know that the sum of the parts are greater than the uh, yeah, total. So uh, in, in with that, it's, it's again another way to access that. Uh, uh, so in practical terms, for example, pulling adverts in, uh, uh, in international magazines where one advert would cost five to $10,000, you know, getting uh, uh, press to come in, uh, to fly press in, and to, to pay them whatever, uh, you know, accommodation and travel. For any one institution, it's impossible. But when we, as I said, pool together the very little money that each of us has for communication mm. and for advertisement, it was possible to, to do that. And hence, uh, you know, people started noticing that, yeah, there is a, a, a value in, Palestine, and there is something happening in Jerusalem, and it is part of a, a, a Palestinian effort, mm -hmm. uh, and that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Bashak, how do you take this? Because yeah. <coughs> obviously there's a lot riding on that. I mean, and it's, it's, it's very much working within the conditions of production, how art operates. And also asking a very specific question, who benefits from the work of art? And how do you deal with that on the ground specifically? Okay. Because you're also dealing with the specificities of a city that is under effective occupation. Yes. Uh, well, I must say that, uh, like all through the summer, uh, I was in contact with the artist talking because, um, like, it was the situation was really severe, and it, there was like 50 days of war in Gaza, and uh, children are being killed, and we were working on a project. So it was like, I questioned myself hundreds of times, what am I doing there? I mean, am I joking? Am I going to do art there? I mean, what else I can do? And we've been talking about this with all the artists I mean, uh, through emails, through Skypes, and through phone calls. And then I've been uh, in touch with Jack and our mama about this. And at the end, I, to all together, we came up with the um, like very, uh, how, how can I say? a uh, very confident decision that we should continue mm -hmm. just because of the fact that it's another form of resistance mm -hmm. because this entire thing this evil thing has happening just to uh, dry out the culture and cut the entire communication and so like um, just uh, giving up would be helping their cause mm -hmm. so from the beginning like we were like we were, everybody was so much touched and, and of course it's, yes, the situation was tough in terms of budget and in terms of many things, but I think it gave uh, people more motivation to work on it and to believe in it. And I must say that, like, like I'm so sure that all the artists would be agree on this. It was one of those shows that there was no evil one person around, like uh, especially artists, but people were loving each other and helping each other. And it, it, it has become such a energy uh, based uh, process, especially the last uh, week of the production, to continue, to finish. Mm -hmm. And it was a very tense situation, yes, but, and then, as you were saying, 
Of course, there were hundreds of accidents. There are hundreds of impossibilities coming to your way. And uh, every time you were finding a solution, uh, and with each and every project, we, uh, we have plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, and so forth. I'm not kidding. For me, it's also very subjective. It's about locating myself, positioning myself. So uh, for me, all these processes, all the uh, like uh, artworks and all this process, it's uh, it's a production of knowledge, yes. But it also it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, alternative uh, information carriers as well. Let's talk a little bit more about this because obviously on the ground, Wilson, I understand that you went to Jack's studio, which was also Jack's father's workshop, where he was a bookbinder since the 1950s. And you walk into the space which is being offered as a space to work in, but in fact you work with the space. So again, another moment of serendipity. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I, I will talk about this, but related to this discussion, yes, I would sir. like to add one thing. While I was going through this list of mine, you know, which is, uh, you know, uh, really made me very, <laughs> you know, <laughs> excited or whatever, you know. Uh, I, I, yeah, terrified <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Uh, I came across another ethic problem. Mm. Who were the subsidies of such, mm. uh, you know, who were the sponsors? Who were the, who were subsiding these lots of uh, exhibitions? Uh, why I was there and how I was invited and how I said yes and so on. All were in front of me and all were to be thought over. But, I might say that with every uh, exhibition that I have participated, there was some kind of a discussion like this. And many of these exhibitions that I have participated, or the workshops, or whatever they were, there was this, for example, I, I worked with alternative groups, groups for a while. And many of those uh, exhibitions were created from nothing, without mm -hmm. money. With, with, uh, with such uh, possibilities that artists were contributing. And uh, there is one side of it that is totally uh, for the, you know, uh, for, for, for the capitalist uh, part of it, we may call it, or whatever you call it, but there is one very sincere part of it where, uh, like, like now we're discussing with the Jerusalem show, or with the others, there is this uh, other sincerity going on. So I really appreciate that. And speaking feeling. of that, when you enter the <coughs> space, uh, Jack's father's space, um, this notion of sincerity, because you didn't want to change anything when you went in no, there. You wanted no, to work no. with the actual space, the fabric of yeah. the space. Uh, actually, uh, with, with the Jack's father's space, it was like an immediate uh, confrontation and uh, feeling that I should be here. You know, y you were together with your brother, and that that gave it another feeling that uh, you know this was a very close feeling for me. Also, those two guys, you know, brothers, uh, they opened up the door and they showed me inside this. Oh, they said, "This is the gallery, you know, that you may use for the show." Well, the gallery, okay, it was a gallery, but it was not a gallery. I, I immediately sensed the uh, feeling in there. And I said, what was it before? And, uh, uh, and I, I, I said, yeah, this, is, this should be something different, because uh, yeah, this is our father's workshop. Then I began to see everything around it, you know, the, the the material which is around me, which belonged to this uh, guy who, who's this uh, Jack's father and so on. And uh, what I wanted to do with the material, you know, not to change anything. Mm -hmm. It was there, it was living, it was there. But you know, it has been uh, lived in other, other ways and so on. And also uh, what I did was to take out uh, whatever inside the shop to bring it into sight and then uh, find out about his about the material the book book binding material that he had done there were few not was not m not many and put them into the vitrines it, uh, the, the shop had a 
wonderful vitrine on this. Nothing was changed, so I just pushed something forward and then I tried to. What, what I added was uh, the material I found in the, in the internet related to bookbinding. I found out that they were all uh, uh, sketches. You know, they, they, they were always describing how to bookbind and so on with, with some sketches. So maybe tomorrow I will talk more about mm -hmm. them. And uh, those <coughs> were pushed into, uh, you know, I, I made, uh, I put them on the, on the walls and that was it, that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I did was for the front of the shop, a new, uh, a new uh, title that was, yeah, she used it. Yeah. This one. Huh. Uh, yeah. Uh, and this was what I made. And the story, of course, was about a man who had, uh, you know, who was a bookbinder and who was to bind everything in his life, his family, his thoughts, his whatever he was uh, taking care of. On, on this slippery ground, like like uh, Palestine or like Jerusalem, which was very important for me, because as you see, to survive in such a territory is not very easy. Mm -hmm. So that was. What's interesting there is that this is effectively a homage, but it's also to tie back to what Jack was saying. It's about ontology. It's about origins. Yes. It's about, to a certain degree, the ideologization of history and historical sites. And that comes across very markedly in Harris Project, this sense of origin, what was there prior, what has became to that knowledge, what has became to those sites. And I just want to turn to Connor briefly, because Connor and I were talking earlier about the context of Northern Ireland, state control, in relation to Jerusalem, but the distinctions. And I think the distinctions are much more interesting than the similarities. And I do recall Belfast, going to Belfast in the 70s, and you would see uh, the PLO flag everywhere. Um, and it was literally, it was, it, it was commandeered as a sort of um, an attempt to create a transnational sense of insurgency. But that in and of itself, I think, created more problems than it actually created solutions. So for you, Connor, bearing in mind that you were working with social practice, that you were working with notion of control in the context of Jerusalem, I'm con just that you didn't have much time to do this research. What was specific to Jerusalem that drew you away from that original thinking? Uh, well, the, very much uh, the sense, of, well, the, the very visible, I mean, the, the Irish context has is, is, is shifted, has changed, there is a peace process. Despite that peace process, Belfast is a city that's carved up by 51 walls. So even though there's a sort of a quiet Cold War, I mean, occasionally it gets hot, but there's an there's incredible uh, social, uh, political and social division in Belfast uh, post-peace process. But I suppose, but, but going to Jerusalem, and there were a couple of different factors. One was this very real li uh, manifestation of control, uh, checkpoints, police, um, you know, access to the space. The very sense of the space, you know, from, you know, the hammam itself, that's, that the settlers are you know, commanding the, uh, the, the tops of, of buildings around, uh, this sense of a space that's, uh, <laughs> under, that is itself under siege. So in a way, this two, the, the siege analogy, if you like, it, it operates on two fronts. It's, it's part of the Zionist project in terms of that sort of siege mentality, which is often used in terms of the Northern Irish context too. But it's also very much about uh, a besieged space that's... Um, Attempting to hang on to its uh, its 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 presence, its identity, uh, in a sense, uh, or or it's, it's part of the social fabric of the city. So I think that that r very real tension uh, w was one of the key elements. Um, that this is a, and I suppose the key, that's the key word. The key word is tension. That there's no there's no space is free from politicisation, <laughs> free from those dichotomies of of access, of control, and I think as Jack was saying earlier, how do you open those spaces? So in a way, there's, there's the attempt to protect those spaces and to, to maintain them, mm. but, but, but also this idea of how do you open them up, how do you make them accessible, how do you, you know, uh, engage them as a site of dialogue, of, of discussion, um, and, and give, them, uh, give them new meaning, new context in that, in that sense, but under, under very specific conditions of, of, 
of duress. Mm -hmm. I mean, that site was, was shut, I'll, you know, I'll, I have an image later I'll, I'll show when, I, when I'm talking about the project in more detail. It was shut down as part of this, uh, you know, because it was so close <laughs> to the um, Haram al-Sharif. It was shut down for a number of days as well. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but it's, uh, you know, but the very real, I mean, and, and the title itself, as you point out, I give the body of work as peripheral vision, and it taps into what Barsha is saying, that I'm an outsider. Mm. You know, I'm from the periphery. I can only have a peripheral uh, viewpoint <laughs> and a peripheral uh, impact uh, and a very, very temporary presence in this, in this city. But it also <laughs> alludes to the broader idea of the periphery and, uh, and you know, bringing to light or... or of course, Palestine is no, no one, you know, there's nothing, you know, everyone, you know, the history's there, but again, it's contested in, in, uh, on, on a global basis. I lived in New York for many years, you know, the Palestinian narrative is just simply disallowed, you know, it's, it's, it's only allowed under, to creep through the cracks under very specific circumstances. It has to be balanced with the Israeli perspective, you know. Mm. So again, so this idea of the peripheral vision is also about how you place yourself as an artist in, 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 a, in a specific space, but also these broader narratives of, of how that space itself is uh, conveyed in, in broader uh, political terms. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, you know, again, it's not specifically about answering questions, but perhaps exploring the issues. Yeah. And I'm not going to come back to it now, but one of the key tensions that I found looking at the images was mm -hmm. if modernism was about the rationalization of space to create a utopian ideal, and when the project of modernism if not fails, then becomes defunct. What you're left with is not utopianism, but control. Yeah. But what interested me about the images was you're still drawing upon a modernist aesthetic, which mm -hmm. I could see Malievich and Lazitsky, for example, mm -hmm. to progress this critique mm -hmm. of the aftermath of modernism. And perhaps you're going to come back to that later, but I, I want to turn to Benji, because as much as there was a sense of ontology, looking at origins, where things are coming from, and I think that was very prevalent in Heron's work too, there's also a sense of teleology, where history is leading to, where are we going as we continue on this path? And it seems to me that your work and that image of you plein air painting is hilarious. I don't know how, <laughs> I mean, the idea of going out there a la a 19th century orientalist and painting the future, so to speak. But this notion of projecting into the future, this notion of speculative knowledge, do you progress that? as a warning, or is this something that you need to develop in terms of, kind of, as you say, a temporary archive, a temporary system of knowledge that can change over time? Well, I'll come to something I didn't explain during the presentation, why I called it temporary ruin, and why I use this term temporary. For anybody that has been there and acquainted to the semantics of the conflict knows that everything temporary is permanent and vice versa. So it's kind of a joke mm -hmm. on the semantic like confusion and disorientation we have over there. And so yes, it's for me a warning in more of a sense. I, it's a permanent ruin, it's, this, it's not a temporary ruin. The temper also is a hope in some ways. I think um, although the modernists failed with the utopia, and I think that is because anybody that read Le Corbusier Manifest of Modernism knows that it's a pretty fascistic book that wants to recreate a per person, ex nihilo, it doesn't exist. But I think artists and me in, in my practices, I have to convey utopia. Mm. This is very important. Convey another idea. As a Palestinian artist, I don't want to fall into the victimhood. Mm -hmm. um, into the victimhood um, like iconography. It doesn't interest me at all. Because also maybe who I am there come from my Armenian minority. I also am half European. So also to position myself very peripheric there, or being from the void, from the between mm -hmm. space. And I think it puts me in a position where I can, I have the tools and I can like, um, like be, Mr. yeah, I'm trying to warn not to fall into the mirror trap of writing a state nation narrative, which is totally a false mm -hmm. construction of history and reading of history. And um, yeah, history, we, anybody that knows a bit about this place knows that there is so much history there and this is very disputed depends on depending on who's narrating it or not and if you want to look back to Hera's project and the whole problem of the name of that place and you can go even further into looking at 
what was the incentive of the archaeologists, the first neo-romantic archaeologists who came there. They wanted basically to justify the Bible by their findings. And it's, a, it's something that really served the Zionist agenda in some ways. So yeah, to answer your question, yeah, I see this as not as a warning, my work more as a warning. Mm -hmm. so and this archive, sorry to interrupt, Benji, becomes a critical archive. It's yeah. an archive that's it's not to do with the past, it's, it's archive in the future, so to speak. It's uh, projecting in the future. I think of people like Rona Sella, who writes about critical archives, Ariana Azmir, and so forth. Folks, in the spirit of engaging the audience, um, I would offer, you know, would anybody have any comments or questions for the artists or for Bashak or general aside? I have a question for Ben Gavarjian um, about the last project that he showed, the recent one. Uh, I was just curious about the method uh, that he followed while you were executing the project. And I'm especially interested in a performative dimension that might have transpired with you going about surveying the places you depict which is a view that is not allowed uh, so to you. Uh, and then the second question that I had was, why is it important that this view meets the public eye? I don't think you have, um, you're trying to make a weak statement like this was the best I could do to you know, uh, make very little space open to all publics in this city. So the first thing I will invite you to do is to go on Google and to check out the area and see um, see the lack of information that we have from there. So from then, the tools I used, I could have obviously gone to get more topographic maps or better satellite photography or something, but it would have costed me much money. Mm -hmm. But I would, <laughs> I would have never been able to find the three dimensional view, like a bird's eye view, and like any other city you have in Google or a yeah, street view, it doesn't exist over there. So the tools I used is basically I became the street view. I took a camera and my bicycle and biked all around the area constantly photographing. Like every angle, climbing on like 10 buildings, the tallest building, <laughs> photographing everything. And so then to construct the whole topography, of course I had a map. I had the map because I needed to see a bit, needed to find a bit where I am so I could in space. But I built everything by feeling of practice of territory, basically. And it's also because this is a commission for an exhibition that has to do with pilgrimage. So I thought as a concept it would be interesting to create like a link with all the old cartography, the old, ma the old maps that were drawn from three quarter from bird eye view. So that's also the link. The concept became very like, I, I like totally immersed myself in this concept of recreating this map with really like hardly any tools. And while doing it, um, <coughs> this project is called Phantomas Gloria of Drones. You can see there is a compass on the right hand side down. It's a drone flying over. And while doing this project, um, a friend of mine bought a drone. <laughs> and I was trying to tell him, yeah, let's go fly the drone over there. He's like, there's no way I'm going to fly my drone over a military base. And now this project was commissioned because you can see the wall does this really weird shape. And it's, that's the shape to annex a tomb. There's a dome on the left. It's called the Rachel's Tomb. It's uh, for Christians and Jews, it commemorates Rachel's. For Muslims, it commemorates one of uh, Muhammad's slaves, Ibn Rabah. And it's a very contested area. So they made this whole wall, the whole like, they laid out this wall in order to annex the tomb and make it specifically and only a synagogue. So the theme around this project was shared and disputed religious spaces around the Mediterranean. Now, I kind of downplayed it because for me it's a project I never ever would have imagined to done. Just because I always thought, yeah, I don't want to start doing things on the wall and how we're closed in. Because it's not my reality, I'll be honest. I'm in Jerusalem, I have an idea, I can go back and forth. That permitted me also to do this project. You know, I have to be honest with who I am in that situation. Like Connor said, he was a foreigner over there, so he could always place himself that way. So that's maybe why I downplayed it. Because for me, it's a problematic project also to do such a work. And in order of also what I believe I want to do as a Palestinian artist, 
I want to transcend the victimhood and I want to transcend our borders. That's for me the most, uh, that what always, I put it as the first, the cornerstone of any project I'm going to do. Thank you, Benji. Uh, any other questions or comments besides <coughs> Limerick? Anybody? Okay, I'm, sir? Anybody? Okay, I'm conscious that we kept you from your coffee break. I'd like to thank Jack, thank Bob Jack, thank the C for hosting. Thank Connor, Goldson, and Benji. Uh, they will all be talking more about the practice. Actually, Benji has already, but Connor will be talking more about his practice, so will Goldson. I know that Bashak will be talking more. Uh, a quick plug for the browse. Uh, the catalog's up there. Uh, a lot of work went into it. There's all the other statements. You can download the guide. You can download the essays. Um, all the images are there, and Bashak and I are gonna upload images of the installations and I think we're going to use this discussion to write up a report which doesn't put a top on it, but perhaps progresses some of the ideas for later iterations of the Jerusalem show. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.